Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the October 5th uh, edition of Crop Talk. And uh, this week, uh, we kind of had a little bit of a, a teaser of it last week where uh, Kim did a little bit of a talking about weed control in the fall. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity to go into more in depth uh, as to uh, some of the harder to kill weeds, start planning for 2023 and uh, maybe even look at, at some of the products that we can be using this fall or are getting prepared to pre prepare for next spring. So uh, Kim will be on uh, giving us a presentation there. Uh, crop scouting panel, uh, some of the panelists are here. Uh, and as we have questions coming through, uh, if something uh, comes up, I will definitely be uh, uh, getting them involved. And uh, yeah, so to start off with, I'm just gonna go through a bit of uh, what we've been seeing uh, over the past uh, week, uh, uh, a little bit different from the week before. Uh, the week before we had poor harvest conditions and uh, I'm gonna say this week we had good week of harvesting. Um, the beginning of the week started off, uh, most area producers got back in the fields and uh, we got a lot of acres harvested in a short period of time. And that uh, definitely helped in uh, bringing up our percentage of completed acres. Uh, uh, in, over the past week. However, though, on the week by the weekend and the last three or three or four days, uh, because of the, uh, the high humidity at night, uh, a lot of fog conditions, and uh, it's made for some uh, really short days of harvest. A lot of producers, uh, um, we have fog till you know 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, and it starts early in the, in the evening and the grain gets so wet that it takes a long time to uh, dry down that grain uh, to uh, get it uh, produced back in the field harvesting. Uh, I've talked to some producers that are testing our combine canola the one, one evening or one day, uh, night before, and it was testing eight or nine 9% 9 moisture and go out the following day and right after lunch and it's 12 or 13% moisture. So just having to uh, wait for the, I think the biggest thing is waiting for the straw to dry down. We got a lot of standing crop there, so when we, the humidity and fog is there at night uh, and early in the morning, it uh, it soaks the entire plant, and that's what's bringing up our moisture. So uh, a lot of producers have been telling me that that's uh, the standing crop seems to be harder uh, to get dried down. Um, the swath crop right now, uh, producers are able to. Uh, uh, I don't know if they're starting a whole bunch earlier, but they're able to go later at night. Uh, they're, uh, I think some of that straw is starting to rot. And once you get the moisture off uh, during the day, you can go a little later at night and it's just uh, uh, makes it a little bit easier for, for harvesting that way. So where do we sit uh, as, uh, as uh, I guess, the, as a province and, and our different regions as the percent completed? Uh, you know, anywhere from, uh, 47% uh, in the inner lake to 76% uh, in the central area of Manitoba. So, uh, but with an overall average of about 63%. And when you look at the numbers, you see uh, a lot of the cereal crops, uh, peas, uh, they're in uh, you know high 80s to low 90s uh, being completed. Uh, and then uh, the biggest one right now is canola, we're uh, around 58% and uh, you know, canola is one of our bigger crops growing, and so uh, it does take up a lot of acres. So that's why there's still a lot of acres out there unharvested, and that's having our major, uh, I guess, uh, uh, major reason why our percentage for uh, completion is only at 63%. Uh, the other thing is soybeans, they're just kind of nicely getting going here. Uh, a lot of producers uh, over this past week have started on some of them. But again, that percentage uh, being done is, uh, you know, 11%. So again, uh, a very, very low, and most of it again in the central part of the province that is being done. And then uh, there, I've noticed more flax acres this year, and uh, that uh, I don't know of anybody that's uh, really done a whole bunch of flax yet. So, and our Manitoba average is right around 3%. 
So I thought it would be interesting just to uh, go back to last year in September 14th. Uh, so uh, this is the 20 days earlier than where we are right now. And you look at our percentage uh, completed harvest was 65%. So last year, by the middle of September, we were sitting basically in the same spot we are right now. So we've lost about three weeks uh, of, uh, of growing condition or of harvest right now. And that's, you know, stems back to the late spring, uh, the longer growing season, and then this uh, extended period uh, here where we've lost probably in the last uh, two weeks, we've only had uh, about four or five days of really good combining weather. And uh, so uh, that definitely has played a, a role in, uh, in slowing down harvest and, uh, and um, just, uh, just uh, making it longer. And, and, you know, the time of year, we're into October, uh, you know, the days uh, are definitely getting shorter, uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, sun's going down. And if we don't have good uh, weather conditions at that time, uh, you know, we need wind uh, just to keep things uh, uh, dry. Uh, and we haven't been getting those, but uh, it's just uh, guys are shutting down at uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock. And it's kind of funny, it'll be, uh, um, you know, and just talking to individual producers and you ask them, so uh, when did you shut down last night? And it was like, we were going good. And then all of a sudden that nine o'clock time period hit and we just had to shut down. You couldn't do anymore. And it seems like everybody's experiencing the same thing. So it's a pretty wide, uh, wide ranging uh, effects that we're seeing right now. I guess one of the things uh, that uh, is a little bit of concern over, you know, over the next few days here uh, we are going to be seeing uh, some cooler temperatures. Uh, hopefully we don't get any rain or, or flurries. Uh, the cool temperatures we can handle, but uh, we don't need any moisture right now because uh, a lot of people are, a lot of producers are looking at uh, grain that is just borderline being dry as it is. So, uh, and this will also affect some of the things that Kim will be talking about today when we see some of these temperatures or if we do receive some of these temperatures over the next uh, little while. This was brought up from the Brandon, uh, uh, Brandon sites, so uh, from Environment Canada, so that's what it's forecasting over the next uh, next few days. So if we can get through Wednesday, Thursday here, uh, I think uh, we'll be all right for a few more days. Uh, as we're getting into the the fall, uh, we're starting to see more and more guys uh, looking at doing some fall work. Definitely seeing a lot of harrowing happening. Uh, I'm seeing. Uh, a lot of anhydrous tanks dropped off in yards. I haven't seen uh, a lot of guys going, uh, talking to a couple of producers yesterday, uh, I think next week, uh, uh, basically they're talking right after Thanksgiving. A lot of guys are telling me probably Tuesday they'll start anhydrousing. So I think we will uh, we'll definitely be uh, seeing a, a lot more action in the fields regarding uh, getting ready for next spring. I thought it'd be interesting to put the soil moisture map on uh, and just to see where we're sitting as a province. And uh, really in general, uh, we're uh, kind of, you know, in, in good moisture conditions right now. Uh, it may not seem like that because we haven't had a lot of uh, large accumulations of moisture over the last little while. But uh, I think when you get down into the soil profile, uh, our depths of the soil, you see that there's still moisture down there. I know talking to a few guys that have been doing soil sampling when they're doing the six to 24, they're, they're saying that they're finding some, some good moisture down there. There are some pockets, however, that uh, are, are on the dry side and uh, they're kind of seeing, seeing them on the map as in the, in the red, reddish type uh, spots. So uh, those would be uh, uh, anyone areas that are kind of that dry to, uh, to very dry, but uh, those areas are, aren't very big. And I, I really think that if we got a, any uh, kind of decent moisture in the fall here uh, after we're done harvest, hopefully that uh, uh, we'll uh, see all those areas uh, spike back up to being, uh, uh, you know, at least uh, average. So fall tillage work, I did mention a bit that it's getting underway, um, you know, as guys got caught up with harvest and, uh, and then we're stopped from harvest and uh, having to wait for things to dry down. We did see a lot of harrowing happening. Uh, some uh, some uh, vertical tillage being done. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, uh, the anhydrous uh, uh, guys are getting ready. I think uh, once uh, we uh, get caught, you know, through this next stretch here, if we don't 
see a lot of uh, moisture from this. Uh, uh, well, maybe it won't be as as busy the following week here, but uh, uh, in talking to producers, they're ready to go for for next week. So I think uh, uh, we'll be seeing that. So uh, you know, as we uh, as we get ready for uh, for starting to plan for next year and getting fields ready for next year. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier on that it would be good to get uh, Kim back on to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, weeds. Uh, seen a lot of sprayers going yesterday. The conditions were good for growing, growing. Uh, so we were seeing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of guys going out and trying to clean up some fields. So uh, with that, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll turn it over to Kim and uh, get her to uh, walk us through uh, uh, the fall weed control and problem weeds for uh, for this coming year. <clears throat> Thanks, Lionel. Um, yeah, if you can go, just go to my first slide. Um, I think Lionel actually has brought up some really good points, um, you know, where we've got a late harvest going on this year. So we're behind the eight ball when it comes to weed control as well, because some of our fields are still not harvested or have very recently been harvested. Um, there is still weeds growing in there. Some of the fields that have been harvested for a while are really greening up. There's a lot of green weeds out there. Um, and we are you know drier than than we'd like to be probably at this time i mean we don't need the moisture because that's going to slow down harvest but our soils are quite dry a lot of the heavier soils have big cracks in them and you know we just saw off lionel's map there that he showed us that you know there are some areas that are quite dry in the province so any weeds that are out there are going to be using up soil moisture we don't know what springs you know going to be like this last spring we were very very wet so that wasn't a concern but we you know sitting here last fall we were talking about this very same thing all this weed growth was you know using up precious soil moisture and you know because we don't know what's coming at us in the spring um that could be quite critical next spring if we don't get a lot of moisture over the winter or we don't get some spring moisture uh, you know some spring rains so um but just going forward, we some of the weeds that we had problems with this year, we had a lot of issues with weed control. It was really variable for weed control. It's kind of all over the board. When we did our weed survey, we were in over 700 fields and, you know, we saw everything, a, a lot of very nice, very clean fields and a lot of fields that were really dirty and kind of everything in between. Um, just given the conditions, the spray conditions that we had, the late seeding, you know, a lot of the crops did come up quite early and or came up quite quickly, sorry, because they were seeding so late and there was really good crop competition um, but then in some cases the fields are still very wet there was some compaction um, emergence wasn't as good as we wanted it to be so we do see there was maybe some holes in these fields some thinner areas with you know less crop in them and so we did see some weed patches in some of these fields and and again then we did see some fields where weed control just really was unacceptable where you know you know the whole field had just a lot of weed issues and that could be a function of just not getting the the right chem when i know we had chem shortages especially with glufosinate on canola and so you know timing that um timing that application was was tough because you only got one shot at it and you might not have got as much product as you wanted even with that one shot so you know we're sitting here in the fall and you know we had some very nice clean fields um, but we had a lot of fields with uh, a lot of weeds on them too so kosher uh, my first slide here we had a lot of kosher issues again that's we would have expected that anyways coming off a couple of dry years and the dry years our salinity increases and then this is a weed that does well in saline spots and so of course we probably saw our kosher patches just get bigger and bigger compounded with the fact that more and more of the kosher is glyphosate resistant so uh some of the products you know glyphosate's not working on this anymore so that's a, a real management issue and that's a, a whole talk in itself but um you know we saw kosher if we can go to the next slide lionel um the pigweeds um they wow I, I don't even know where to start with these i mean we've got good old red root pigweed but we have seen more and more water hemp this summer um, I just got some stats in from the lab, uh, the PSI lab that has been doing some samples for us. And, you know, they've had 90 submissions in this year, which I think is the most ever. And um, a vast, um, the vast majority of those were confirmed to be water hemp. And so we do have more water hemp sightings. It is being eradicated when we find it. But we know, you know, the more we look, the more we find. And um, there's probably more of that out there. And so we're looking, we're really concerned about water hemp. We're concerned about smooth pigweed as well. Um, that's maybe not as common other than in south, like southern Manitoba seems to have a little bit of that. 
um, very similar to a Powell's pigweed, which is just like kind of like a really big red root pigweed. And uh, but worldwide, it's uh, got res glyphosate resistance. Not not here yet, but that's why it's actually on our not noxious weeds list. And then Palmer amaranth as well. So. But just being pigweeds, any pigweed uh, can germinate pretty much year round. Well, not in the winter, obviously, but pretty much, you know, all through the season. But they can germinate right. They can germinate late in the fall and they can set seed in as little as two weeks. Um, that's, you know, they won't set a lot of seed at that point. Um, but if you see me on the speaking circuit this winter, I actually have a couple of tiny little pigweeds, um, water hemp actually, that have germinated probably they're only a couple of weeks old I just got them a couple of weeks ago so they would have germinated sometime in September they're four inches three to four inches tall and they have seed on them um, so I uh, pressed them and I laminated them and I'll be able to show you guys that this winter but pigweeds I'm really concerned about um, because just the fact that if we don't control these and if we're not doing any fall weed control we still can get seed set from very small pigweed plants um, regardless of which pigweed it is so we need to be concerned about this uh, if we can go to the next one foxtail barley um, and again we saw tons of foxtail barley this year again that's not on not 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 un, not unexpected because we're coming off a couple dry years and again same issue as kosha this is um uh, a halophyte which means it likes it likes to grow in in um, saline soils where there's salts and where other crops don't grow well or other other plants nothing will grow and so we did see huge patches of foxtail barley now i know we're talking about fall weed control here but this is an issue in the spring when you're going into spring wheat a really good system to use and probably the best thing out there for foxtail barley is to use olympus as a pre-seed um, and then follow that up with a group two product in the wheat a uh, group two gruminicide so you'd be looking at uh, vera or, or Velocity um, or Everest or uh, Simplicity, something like that. So you'd be looking at one of those products following in, um, for your in-crop application, but when you uh, couple that with a pre-seed Olympus, it does a really good job of knocking back that foxtail barley. So that's something to be planning for right now and talk to your Bayer guys about that. We've got some good, really good reps and you know they can show you how to use that system. Um, the next slide, um, Lionel, is lambs quarters we saw a ton of lambs quarters i get asked all the time is it resistant not that we know of uh part of the weed survey we we uh, we went and gathered weed seeds and so we did about 160 fields i think across the province a subset of the 700 that we did on the weed survey and so the weed seeds are gathered they're grown out and they're sprayed and basically you know if they don't die or you know we, we then they're resistant so we gathered you know some of the fields had lambs quarters so we are testing for it if you do have any lambs quarters that you suspect might be resistant then uh you know we can get that checked um there's labs that will do that basically you have to gather the seed this is the time to do it obviously before you've harvested and it's gone uh but you basically send it to the lab they grow it out and they spray it you know to see what what kills it what doesn't kill it i think a lot of times though with lambs quarters we miss it um it gets quite big uh fast um like a lot of products need to you need to control lambs quarters when they're you know under six leaves or and that's a very very small lambs quarters plant and i think they just get away on us and then they get very big so that's something to be concerned with uh concerned about again the resistance issue it's it, you know wouldn't be unheard of if we start to get resistance i mean that's just kind of the nature of the beast when we spray herbicides um but as of yet i don't know of any if we can go to the next slide, uh, these are pictures that Lionel actually sent me yesterday. He's been out in the fields and he's been looking. This is round leaf mallow. It survived last week's frost very well. It's very green. Um, you know, it almost looks like the one picture there on the right hand side looks like it's still flowering. Um, but yeah, lambs quarters, or sorry, round leaf mallows are a pretty tough plant and uh, it's very green and that would certainly still be a candidate for herbicide application. The next slide, Lionel. Um, South thistle, there's a picture, it's still again very green, um, still setting seed, um, still a good candidate, lots of leaf area there to hit. So if we can go into the slides, um, we went over this really quickly last week because we'd had a, had a, uh, a slight frost, uh, but again we see some of these weeds are, are, um, are, have survived that obviously, and a lot of fields, you know, you drive by and they're still really green, especially the earlier harvested ones, they're really greening up now with that little bit of rain we got uh, 
I guess, close to two weeks ago now. Um, so the usual suspects, the perennials, you know, we look at the thistles, the dandelion, the quack. Don't see quack as much anymore, but we did see, we do see a bit of it here and there. And especially, you know, as we go more into conservation tillage and we talk about, you know, carbon credits and reducing the tillage on our farms, um, you know, I think that you'll start to see, you definitely start to see a shift towards more perennial weeds when you don't you have tillage as a tool to control weeds. The winter annuals that we'd see, you know, we, these are starting to emerge now and some of these they'll emerge all the way up through till freeze up. But narrow leaf talk spear, night plant catch fly, white cockle, um, though in anything in that family, there's also um, uh, cow cockle as well and bladder campion in that. Stinkweed and cleavers, those can all emerge in the fall. And annuals, again, um, if most of them, the annuals that would be emerging from seed right now will not be setting seed before the winter. So we're not really concerned about seed set other than the pigweeds, which we talked about already. Um, but just the fact that, you know, they're there, they're using up nutrients, they, they use a lot of nutrients and they use a lot of moisture. So again, that's a concern. And that would be something that if we've got a chance to get them this fall. And this is another situation too, where I, um, I know we have a lot of herbicide resistance in the province. We have a lot of group two resistance with different weed species. Um, I think, you know, it's not a bad idea to be using those group twos in the fall if there are some resistant weeds and they don't die from the herbicide application you know winter's going to kill them anyways so I'm way you know that's I, I'd rather be seeing some of those group twos I'm you know using them in the fall uh, doesn't really have the same effect on, on, on increasing resistance as it does um, when you use them in the spring and then you you're plants don't die and then they move you know and then they're able to set seed and then that increases the resistance issue so um next slide so when's the best time allow regrowth after harvest again that's not going to work that's this year with a late harvest we just don't have the calendar days to do that but um four to six weeks would be ideal uh, some of our fields have been harvested for a while so you know they are good candidates and like Lionel said there is a lot of sprayers going so that's great to see um, but you do need green growing tissue um, you know they say minimum four leaves um, but start to spray perennials um, now you can wait a little longer for the winter annuals to get more than emerge um, you know basically you can spray right up until freeze up um, as, 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 as depending on the product and so we're going to get into some of those products now. Um, so the temperatures though, again, we went over this last week and this is really important. We've got some cold temperatures coming. We've got possibly a frost tonight, but it looks like for sure across the province tomorrow night as well. And uh, we're gonna be, um, and so after, uh, we need our temperatures above eight degrees for a few hours after application. So this time of year, you know, we've had some really good spray days um, in the last couple of weeks other than when it was raining. And, uh, but temperatures above eight degrees for that few hours. So usually that's mid morning or early afternoon, but we've had quite a lot of time in order uh, to, to get some spraying done during the day. But after a frost, last week's frost, uh, you know, was a killing frost for some plants. Uh, but if the leaf tissue is still green and pliable, it's still a candidate for a herbicide application. You need about 60% of the leaf tissue still alive in order for that herbicide to work. And after any frost, you should wait two to three days and assess. Now the frost that looks like it's coming Thursday night looks like it's gonna be a big one. Uh, we're, depending which weather station you look at in Southern Manitoba and Carmen, we're looking at a minus four frost. I think Lionel was showing a minus eight frost there in Brandon. That's, that's a big frost. So we'll have to evaluate what that does and you know I would think we'd be waiting until at least into early next week before we're looking at spraying again after that one to see what is still a candidate for spraying after that. So again um, that as so the product sorry um, I uh, wait three days uh, or longer if possible before tillage. I know we had a question come in about harrowing when is it a good idea to harrow before or after spraying Neither is a really good idea um, when you're harrowing and if you're aggressively harrowing, you're doing a lot of damage, you're uprooting some weeds, uh, you're doing some damage to the weeds that don't get uprooted and uh, that'll actually stop them from taking in the herbicide quite as well. You would want to wait till they resume growth after you've done harrowing or if you've sprayed, then you'd want to wait as long as possible, at least a day, um, but ideally, you know, you'd want to wait three days to, especially if you're going after some of those um, perennials. If you're going after perennials, you'd be wanting to wait three days. So glyphosates, uh, low rates, don't cut it if there's little leaf material. There's a variety of tank mix products and I'm a big fan of water. Unless you have hard water or you have a water issue, um, you need to be getting good coverage and usually that means 10 gallons. 
And even with glyphosate, again, unless you have an issue with some hard water um, or some, some poor water quality, uh, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing 10 gallons with glyphosate. And our next slide. So I'm going to go into some specific products here. When we're looking at distinct, um, that's dicamba, uh, which is a group four, and diflufenzapir, which is a group 19. So it's basically just uh, heated up Banvil. Um, it's used, we're using the 40 acre rate. It, it's a really good product for kochia, round leaf mallow, canna thistle, dandelion, the wormwoods. We've seen a lot of wormwoods this year. Volunteer canola as well. Uh, the one thing with kochia, we are, there is a very, very small amount of dicamba uh, resistant kochia starting to show up. Alberta, they've been finding quite a lot of it. Um, in the last uh, survey of kochia in Manitoba, there was some found. I think there was one population found, but this is something to be watching. We have been starting to rely very heavily on dicamba and fluoroxapir as well, uh, which there is some resistance to as well. That's just a, another group four, but a, a different subgroup of group four. And we are starting to see some kochia resistance. So just be watching for that. But as of yet, dicamba has kind of been one of our go-to products to take care of kochia. And, you know, we need that uh, as our kochia issues increase and as the glyphosate resistance increases in our kochia populations. So with spring crops, um, if you had got this on by October 1st, then you can seed any of these wheat, barley, oats, canary seed, corn, canola, lentils, field peas, and soybeans, so pretty much just about anything you'd want to seed. Um, but um, as we're approaching October 15th, then you're just looking at wheat, barley, oats, canary seed, and corn for um, spring crops following distinct. Uh, our next slide. This is just a picture um, of uh, from BSF and just showing you the untreated versus distinct and glyphosate and merge. Um, and so it really does a good job. I know lots of farmers that have used distinct in the fall and been very, very happy with it and really cleans up some of those big weeds as well. So um, next slide. Looking at the Express products, again, these, you know, been around for a very long time. And, you know, I, I, I am concerned with using group twos in the spring because of, um, especially as pre-burns, because we've got so many group two, starting to get so many group two resistant weeds. Um, but um, in the fall, again, if something doesn't die, then winter will kill it. So this is tribenuron, straight tribenuron, which is a group two, um, the 80 acre rate, and that's going to get your narrow leaf tox beard, your dandelion, your flixweed, uh, cow cockle, your volunteer canolas, your lamb's quarters, and your wild buckwheat. Um, spring crops, if you put it on by October 1st, which we've just got past, uh, most crops, including forages, um, but if after October 1st, juice, you can't grow uh, canola, corn, or flax. You have to stay away from those crops. So our next one in the Express family, um, still these are FMC products. And again, we have great reps in the province here. If you've got any questions at all with any of these particular products, just call your reps. And I'm also just talking about the um, kind of the heritage brand name products. There are uh, lots of generics out there. Um, I'm not as familiar with their labels as I am with the heritage products. There are some differences on some of the labels, so you need to read your labels very carefully. Most of that is captured in the Guide to Crop Protection, but again, if you are using a generic product, you need to check the label very carefully because it may not be exactly the same as what you're used to if you're using you know, one of the heritage products like the Express brands. So anyways, Express FX is Tribenuron. Again, that's our group two with some dicamba thrown in. That's group four using the 80 acre rate. Um, and again, so that's just, it just heats up that, um, that quite nicely. And again, so this is a good kochia product, dandelion, kochia, cleavers, uh, narrow loop tox beard, flixweed, Russian thistle. If you have that, saw a bit of that in the province this summer, and we do tend to see that too, um, in the areas you'll, you'll maybe find that in the drier areas where you see lots of kochia because it does well on the salty, um, soils as well and wild buckwheat. Um, for spring crops, if you had it on by October 1st, you can grow wheat, barley, oats, corn, canola, lentils, soy, white beans. Um, after October 1st, you're just looking at cereals. So you're looking at wheat, barley, and oats because of that dicamba in there. We don't want that residue there still hanging around in the spring. So our next slide is our, again, another FMC product, Express Pro. Um, this is tribenuron, basically expressed with ally or metsulfuron. That's ally is metsulfuron. That's a group two product. Um, so this is, these are both group twos, um, but you will get some extended control with this product. So we're looking at the 80 acre rate. We're looking at basically very similar weeds, 
to what we've been talking about already with the express products. Um, but you do get that extended control for about 15 days. So when do you apply that? If you applied that really late in the fall, uh, you would get some control in the spring. But if you were to put it on now, that 15 days would, you know, would help, would just be, would just be kind of used up this fall. And again, because of that ally in there, that met self you're on, you're looking at spring crops or wheat, barley, and oats. So we do have loads of products for uh, to use ahead of wheat, barley, oats. We're a little more limited on, you know, our broadleaf crops, um, like our, especially our canola and things like that. Um, the next slide, I've just got a picture here, I think, um, of Express Pro versus a competitor uh, plus glyphosate. So just having that, um, and again, most of these obviously you'd be putting on with glyphosate as well. And uh, it really just burns off your dandelions like like crazy. And that's another weed we had a lot of this year. Um, saw a lot of that in crops where, and, and some quite big dandelions. So because there's so much seed flying around, we'd expect to maybe see a bit more of that in our, in our crops, in our uh, next spring. So just kind of watch out for those dandelions. They can get really big and they really use a lot of nutrients and a lot of water. So our next slide. Um, so again, this is just a slide off from FMC and just compares their 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 products. So we've got Express SG, uh, which is again just that straight um, uh, straight trivenuron, and it's got lots of crop flexibility, lots of good application timings. You've got you know you've got loads of um, loads of uh, space on this one to with lots of different options. Um, if we go into the FX because of the dicamba in there, um, and then we go into the pro, which is extended weed control for cereals. Um, and again, so we've got our different groups in there and um, and our spring recropping. So this is a nice table. They have lots of stuff on their website. And again, we've got really great reps to deal with. So talk to your FMC reps about that. And our next slide um, is in Truvix, which is actually Express FX plus Carfentrazone or AIM, uh, which is a group 14 product. Now that's just a burn off. There's no residual at all with that with that group 14. Some of our group 14s are residual. Um, our group 14s are quite a um, a unique group. They've got a lot of different subgroups in them and they're all a little bit different from each other. And we have everything in a group 14 from something that just does uh, something uh, that just does weed control by um, weed seeds as they emerge and it's got residual um, to something like a carfentrazone aim which is a pure burn off product no residual um, so you know um, it's but it's nice to have that group 14 in there because that's a group that we don't use necessarily very much of so it's basically express fx but you get this added burn off from the carfentrazone because we do have weeds that are up right now and that is a good burn off product it works quite well, especially if the weeds are still small. So again, be watching, you know, watching your weeds and when you're going to be spraying these things. So the spring crops are basically the same as the FX label. Um, so if by October 1st, which we've passed now, we've got quite quite a lot of cropping choices. But if we're putting this one on after October 1st, we're still looking just at wheat, barley and oats. So if we go to our next slide, we're looking at Blackhawk. Uh, this is another group 14, again, a little bit different again, mostly a burn off product. I think very little soil activity on this one, uh, but 2,4-D. So we've got pyroflufen and 2,4-D uh, together. There's a 60 acre rate on this. They've got lots of broadleaf weeds, but they've got to be um, less than two inches in height or width. So they need to be quite small, but you can put this one on, you know, all the way up to freeze up and the spring crops, there are basically no restrictions. So, you know, if you're concerned about what your cropping uh, rotation is next year and you're not sure what's going on certain fields and you're not sure it's going to be a cereal um, then that is this is a product that you could look at and um, I think there's been people quite happy with this one and again I like us I like us using that group 14 and it's a different group 14 than some of the ones we've been using before uh, so our next slide Paradigm Pre, this one's been around, you know, for a while. That's um, haloxifen, which is a group four, really nice group four there. It actually has really good, um, does a lot of weeds and a lot of bigger weeds as well. Really nice product. Um, also does barnyard grass. Haloxifen also will get barnyard grass. So that's nice to know when you're looking at it as a spring applied product for um, you know, post uh, post emergent applications, it does uh, it, it does mostly broadleaves, but it actually does get barnyard grass, which we do see a lot more of in the wet years. We saw a lot of that show up late in the summer, and you know there'll be a lot more seed in the ground for next year, so that's something to watch for. And then Florasculum, which is a Group Two product, so it's a 60 acre rate, 60 acres per jug rate, and we're looking at uh, lots of weeds on here. 
dandelion, volunteer canolas, um, the shepherd's purse chickweed, which, you know, that's another weed we start to see in the fall. And we do see that showing up after some of the wet years when it gets a bit wetter. Cleavers, cow cockle, night flower and catch fly, Canada thistle, there's suppression on that, suppression on the south thistle, uh, suppression on the perennial south thistle as well. Um, it'll get smart weed and it'll also get light infestations of kochia, but not, um, I, I, that's, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider this a kosher product. Most of our, all of our kosher in Manitoba is group two resistant and haloxifen um, will do a little bit on it, but it's not, certainly it's not like a dicamba. Um, our spring crops, if after October 1st, then just our cereals, our wheat, barley, and oats. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, so then pre-pass or, whoops, and, um, and, fle or, and flex, which is just fluoracillam, a straight group two, and glyphosate. So pre, and again, lots of generics on this. Um, just check your labels, um, check your product sizes and stuff. I'm just, again, talking about the heritage products here. Um, pre-pass flex is 80 acres per jug rate. The pre-pass XC is 40 acres per case rate. Um, chickweed, really good product for chickweed, cow cockle, dandelion, volunteer canolas, smartweed, wild buckwheat, cleavers, and kochia, but obviously not anything that's a group two resistant because we've just got that fluorastolam in there, especially our kochia that's group nine resistant as well. And spring crops, anything after October 1st, or sorry, uh, yeah, uh, August 1st, uh, we are just looking at spring cereals like wheat, barley, and oats. And our next one, is Corex, which is dicamba and fluorastolam mixed together. So again, we've got that nice dicamba in there. If you're looking at some, uh, looking at kochia issues, it's uh, 56 acres per case rate. It's a bit of a different rate there, but anyways, but really good product for dandelion, perennial south thistle, kochia, of course, because of the dicamba, um, cleavers, volunteer canolas, uh, wild buckwheat, chickweed, cow cockle, smartweed, stinkweed, and spring crops. Again, anything after October 1st, we've just looking at our wheat, barley, and oats. So again, lots of options going into cereals in the spring. We've got loads of products to use. Um, our next product, Focus. There's kind of a lot on this slide. This is something a fall registration is fairly new for Focus. We're used to using this in the spring. This is Pyroxysulfone, which is a group 15 product, which a lot of us aren't using a lot of, but this is basically Zidua. Um, that's a standalone product from BSF, but um, Focus is an FMC product. So again, if you're considering using this product, talk to your rep. This is a really, there's a really, I think the fall use has a really good fit here in Manitoba. Um, it's got Carfentrazone, which is a, a group 14. Again, basically you've got a burn off product in it, but the pyroxysulfone works on weed seeds as they emerge. So now the product itself requires minimum half an inch of moisture to activate. So spring snow melt will actually activate it early in the spring. So this is why a late fall application you know that's a good idea um, if that works on your farm so that would target our early germinating weeds in the spring like our kochia our foxtail barley our stinkweed our wild mustard downy and japanese brome and things like wild oats this needs to be the last pass across the field so after everything's been done all of your fertilizer applications any tillage any harrowing this is the last pass you know, spray it, walk away, park the sprayer for the year kind of thing. If any weeds are emerged, we would add glyphosate and surfactant. So I would expect we'd be doing that anyways. Um, a couple of different rates on here. If we've got more than 3% organic matter, we have to use the higher rate. So that's 33 acres a jug. If we've got less than 3% organic matter, we are using the 40 acres per jug rate. So our spring crops are going to be field corn, uh, field peas, lentils, soybeans, sunflowers, and spring wheat, but not durum. And do not apply any Authority 480 to wheat in the spring and do not apply any Authority Supreme. Um, the Authority 480 is um, sulfentrazone and uh, and just uh, just because of uh, stacking and residues, um, that's, that's not, you know, that's something that we can't do. So we can't, if we're using focus in the fall, we can't be using um, Authority 480 to, on wheat. And we don't want to use any Authority Supreme either on the crops that it's registered on because Authority Supreme actually has pyroxysulfone in it as well as sulfentrazone in the Authority. So we can't use that. So also do not apply if pH is greater than 7.8 or if organic matter is less than 1% or greater than 7%. Uh, but again, this is a, a really nice uh, product, the pyroxysulfone phone or the, the Zidua product that's in there um, does broadleafs and grasses and you know it's a different grouping and so when we're talking herbicide resistance it's really good to start using some of these different products. 
Um, if we can go to the next slide, this is a new one, Smolder, or newer, newer in the guide last year. It was first in the 2022 guide. This is saflufenacil, which is basically, which is heat, the heat brands, plus metsulfuron. Again, that's our ally. So you've got a group 14 and a group two together there. And uh, it's an 80 acre a case rate, and it'll do weeds, a lot of weeds. So, you know, kochia, burn off that kochia, the cleavers, uh, Canada fleabane, which again, we're starting to see more and more of that. And, um, you know, that's something we're going to have to watch for. There was a ton of Canada fleabane this year. To my knowledge, it's not resistant yet, but we have to watch this one. There was just so much of it and so much seed flying around. So we're going to have to get familiar with that weed very quickly. Lamb's quarters, wild buckwheat, wild mustard stinkweed, red root pigweed, um, dandelion, can thistle, round leaf mallow. Again, saw a lot of that this year and Lionel showed us our pictures of some quite big ones. Um, those ones are going to be a little bit harder to kill. But uh, anyways, a narrow leaf talk spirit and volunteer canola and spring crops wheat, which includes durum and barley and oats. And our next slide, um, other products, basically 2,4-D, MCPA, um, four ounces is probably safe. I would not go any higher than six because of overlaps. And, you know, if you, especially if we do end up with a very early spring, we've got some very early spring seeding. Um, but there was some research done in Saskatchewan that found that it was quite safe, um, quite late in the fall. I think they were spraying right up until it was pretty much freezing coming out of the sprayer and finding, um, you know, that the four ounces was definitely safe. Um, for spring burnoff, um, um, and pre-harvest products, um, there's lots of things, um, AIM, Bromoxynol, Conquer, Goldwing, Heat, Thunderhawk, lots of things. They're not registered for the fall. There are some fall, there are, you know, these are things to cons you know, consult your product reps and talk about whether we need to be doing something late in the fall or maybe some early spring burn-offs and that type of thing. Um, the one thing I haven't talked about is um, Ed, the, the group three products, our yellows, <laughs> um, the yellow products, um, so our Ed or Treflan, that type of thing. We're actually going to be having um, Gowan, um, Alan Christensen from Gowan. Gowan will be talking next week on those and he'll be giving us a really good talk uh, about how to use those products. Um, a lot of different scenarios uh, where they're best used. Um, talk about the different tillages that are needed to activate those products and some of the different combinations because we all have different tillage implements and, and how we want to use them. And uh, anyway, so the ones that I haven't talked about that we will be putting on in the fall or that we can put on in the fall as well as the spring are things like our edge and our trefline and our fortress. And uh, we're going to be covering those next week. Um, Alan is going to cover those. So I would encourage you to, to listen to that. He's a really good speaker and uh, really knows the products. So with that, I don't really have anything else. If there's any questions, I can answer them or we could just wait. I could just, um, you know, wait for the panel. Sorry, Kim, I forgot to unmute myself there. Um, uh, yeah, there has been a couple of questions that have come in, come in and um, uh, first one is uh, when you were talking about lambs quarters, uh, the question mm -hmm. was, has there been any resistance uh, reported uh, or is it just something we were worried that yeah. might show up? Yeah, nothing, um, nothing for sure. There's lots of guys talk about it and and again we, because we see so much lambs quarters show up late in the season i there ha, there's nothing that i know of that's actually been verified there might be some out there i wouldn't be surprised um but again we're we'll see what shows up after this year's um we uh herbicide resistance survey that followed our, our weed survey. Again, we did 160 fields. Um, whatever weeds we could find in that field, we gathered the seed off of. Um, I did about a quarter of those fields myself. And so I, I did whatever, wherever I could find uh, lamb's quarters, definitely I, I harvested it. And so we will be checking for it. So, but if you do have any that you suspect, then this is the time to gather that seed. Um, you can contact me um, or Lionel and we can get you in touch with some of the labs that will actually do that, do the testing for you. Basically, you gather the seed, you have to grow it out and 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 they spray it with different herbicides to see whether they work or not. Basically, that's how, that's how it works. Um, but yeah, to my knowledge, we, we don't have anything confirmed, but we hear a lot about it. Everybody talks about it every year. I just, I suspect a lot of it is just escaping um, the lamb's quarters has to be sprayed when it's very small and a lot of lamb's quarters is out of stage by the time we get there and spray it in crop in the spring and then it's kind of one of those sleeper weeds that's there under the canopy and then all of a sudden by you know by late july august it's all of a sudden up and 
it's a, it's up above the canopy and then we notice it so much. Um, yeah, but I, I know personally, I saw a lot of it this year. Um, and now a lot of it, pretty much everything I've seen that's been pre-harvested, you know, with glyphosate, it all, it killed it all. Um, it's all nice and brown right now. So I haven't seen anything that escaped a pre-harvest application, but not all of it did get a pre-harvest. So there is still some green lambs quarters out there that could be, har you could be taking the seed off if you want to, if you want to see if it's resistant. Okay. Um, growing canola next year and have a dandelion issue. What would your recommendations for me be for this fall? Yeah, that's a oh, that's a hard one. Um, that is a hard one because we anything that would do really really well on on canola uh, or sorry on on the dandelions is um, is going to is is you know has residual and we we can't you know we can't grow canola. Um, yeah, that that is a tough one. I would just go probably the I honestly think the best thing on that just to be safe, uh, because again, some of our soils are a little bit dry right now, and I am concerned about residual this fall. I would just be doing a good rate of glyphosate, and I would be trying. I would just be trying to get in there and get that canola growing fairly early, fairly early on. And we do the the dandelion problems um, a lot if you're the pre-harvest and an early an earlier pre-harvest actually helps dandelion if you can get that down under the canopy and get that you know get that dandelion taken care of but that is a really tough one there really aren't any really great products that would be safe to use ahead of canola in the spring so what about and this is just me thinking here what about a glyphosate with the four ounces of 2,4-D this fall to get the burn off and yep. then, then maybe a glyphosate in the spring yeah, yeah, I would look, I'd be looking at that. We do have some, some, de there are some other, some products in the spring that, you know, we've got more products than ever, like there's some newer products to use ahead of, uh, ahead of, um, ahead of canola in the spring. Uh, but for fall products, it, probably your 2,4-D would be about the only thing. And I would stick to that four ounces on that because anywhere you've got an overlap or anything, then you're doubling that. And I'd be really careful with that. But four ounces of 2,4-D, um, yeah, or, or. Like I said, or you can throw or something like a black hawk as well. I mean, because that's got that group 14 in there, that might help as well. And there's basically no restrictions, but that's just a little bit of 2,4-D in there as well. Um, but using a, the, I would be using a, a good leader of glyphosate. I, you cannot scrimp on glyphosate. You cannot, you know, on when you're looking at stuff like that. But that is a tougher one. And that that's kind of a, just a bigger issue of getting those dandelions kind of it's uh you know in, uh, out of there in the crops that we when we have the chance to use the other products like there's a lot of products I talked about today that do a great job on dandelions in the fall but they're for use ahead of cereals so looking at your rotation and making sure we are using those ahead of cereals um, I think sometimes we tend to um, maybe not use as many products in the fall when we know we're going into cereals next spring because we've got so many options next spring and also in crop for cereals but the thing is, um, this is a good time to clean up those fields um, because we've got that safety. We can go into cereals with a lot of different products, you know, using those products in the fall. Um, this is a chance to maybe clean up some of that stuff um, and do a better job at that in the fall um, and not rely totally in the spring. And I think that's where we need to go after some of these perennials like our dandelions. Okay, and one more quick one, Kim. Uh, you were talking about focus. Uh, so just go out there this fall and like I've got foxtail patches, just spray the mm -hmm. foxtail patches and that would be help for control next year? Well, like the focus is going to work on weed seeds as they emerge. So it's not going to work on emerge. Like, I mean, well, you're probably going to put glyphosate in there and that's maybe, you know, that's going to help. Um, but that's like a lot of when the foxtail barley comes up in the spring, it is tiny. I've I saw a little bit this year, but it's tiny. Those those plants are so small. They're like tiny little needles almost. They're very. It's a very fine grass. Um, so your your focus actually works on weed seeds as they emerge. So it's not going to do anything on those clumps that we're looking at right now this fall. It's not going to do that. But there's going to be lots more little ones come next spring so around there and wherever that seed blew to. So. Um, just the way that product works, it's on weed seeds as they emerge. So you're looking at putting that on late in the fall for the foxtail barley that would be coming up first thing in the spring. It's just not going to do those patches. 
I mean, yeah. you're looking at yeah, something different there. Okay, yeah. So the clumps, it's not going to work on, but the, just the seeds. No. Okay, yeah. good. Thanks yeah. for that one up. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Kim. Uh, as usual, uh, great presentation and lots of good information. Uh, I think as we go into uh, fall here, because uh, like I mentioned, there's a lot of sprayers still moving around. So I think we're going to uh, continue to see that over the next little while. And hopefully it doesn't get too cold over the next couple of days that we still have some options after that. So uh, thanks again, Kim. And, uh, and thanks again for mentioning about uh, uh, next week, uh, we're going to have uh, Andy on and he's going to talk about uh, the uh, Edge and Avidex and Fortress and, uh, and all those good things we can put on in the fall and proper ways of putting them on. So uh, thanks for mentioning that as well. Okay, so um, there hasn't been a lot of questions come in for the panel today and because of Time. I've got a few slides I'd like to go through, so uh, I'm going to continue going here. Um, as usual, the Manitoba hay listing, uh, if you've got hay for sale or if you've got uh, looking to buy hay, definitely check out that website. It's been fairly busy this year. I think there's a lot of hay in the province that uh, is looking to find new homes. So if you're, uh, if you're interested, uh, definitely go to that site. Uh, crop residue burning, uh, that's on again, so we need, need to keep uh, aware of whether it's a burn day or not a burn day. Uh, when we get those high humidities, we probably are in situations where it's not a burn day, so definitely keep, uh, keep on top of that. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that uh, about three or four uh, um, crop talks ago, I guess, that their Manitoba Agriculture is going to be putting on some computer skill workshops and uh, basically what it is it's going to be in-person workshops and they're going throughout the province uh, so i divided their poster into a few different sections here and uh, so if you're interested in learning about some of the basic skills of working on the computer internet uh, skills email skills uh, website navigation how to fill out online applications how to save attach email an online application uh, that's all what's going to be happening at these these workshops. There's going to be uh, a couple of people coming around that have pretty good knowledge of uh, of, uh, of computers and be able to uh, you know just help you with uh, just some of the basic stuff on computers. I know we all uh, uh, try our best, but I think a little bit of a refresher course would be would be great. So uh, uh, you need to register, and uh, the uh, number for register our toll free number there is there to register or you could email us at agriculture at gov.mv.ca and uh, uh, to register for it um, here uh, the, the workshops are going to be have happening in the evening and times are going to be uh, uh, at different times depending on the location and like I mentioned they're having them in several locations so there's going to be one close to you uh, so if you're interested in uh, getting some of this uh, updates on on just being able to uh, work through your computer, uh, it seems like have all our applications are beginning to be online applications, and it just would be uh, kind of good knowledge for yourself to have uh, when it comes to, uh, to filling this stuff out. So uh, uh, these are the locations where they're going to be handled. Had that. Um, also, uh, we're getting into October, or we are in October, and that's when the uh, Clean Farms is going to be having most of their uh, pickup days for uh, pesticides and livestock medications. I think some of the first ones are the the 20th or the 20th of October or in that range. So you know we're definitely getting close to those days. So uh, keep an eye out for them. Go to their website, find out when they're going to be in your area, and uh, get rid of some of that stuff that's been hanging around the farm for a while and you're not quite sure what to do with it. If you've got questions, uh, feel free to contact any of the crop production extension specialists. Uh, uh, there's uh, seven of us now, and there's our contact information. So uh, feel free to contact us anytime, and we can give you a hand with uh, the stuff that's going on. Uh, our farm production extension specialists, uh, again, uh, the four of them and their contact information. One of the things uh, that's probably going to come up uh, over the next little while here is uh, if we uh, get some uh, some hard frost or some killing frost, is we'll get start getting lots of questions regarding nitrates. So uh, 
remember uh, those uh, to contact any of uh, the, the people that I gave you the numbers on. Also, there are uh, probes in the offices, in some of the offices where you can come and borrow them and get those samples sent away to central testing labs or one of the labs to see what your nitrate levels are if you're concerned about it. So uh, uh, this is the uh, locations of the MASC offices. A lot of those offices will have the hay probes as well. So uh, just uh, give a call ahead of time to make sure that one is available or they have one there for you. And uh, that's it for today's webinar. I'd like to thanks, thanks for attending. Thank him for the great presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact Laurie or myself and then join us next week, uh, be the October to the 12th. And hopefully by that time we're in the high 80s of, uh, of harvest being done. Thanks again for attending.